I always lie. There's a conundrum for you. If we tell people that we're lying, are we lying or telling the truth? Yes? No? Difficult to tell, isn't it? That's this week's episode for The Right Focus. Three important types of oppositions that can quickly entangle us. If you've ever been mixed up about paradox, irony, or satire, this episode can help. Welcome to The Right Focus, a podcast for writers, newbies, and veterans, and everyone in between. We're hosted by M.A. Lee with the assistance of Remy Black and Edie Rooms, all from Writers, Inc. Books. Our focus is productivity, process, craft, and tools. Each episode lasts as long as it takes to fix a quick dinner, drive a short commute, or take a brisk walk. Resources and links are in the show notes. Visit us at therockfocus.blogspot.com. Now, on to this week's episode. The world is built on opposites. Remember these? On, off? up, down, good, evil, sun, moon, straight, curved, premeditated, spontaneous. We notice the expected opposites, stop, drive, smile, frown, order, free choice. The three most difficult types of opposites to have in our writing are paradox, irony, and satire. These are sometimes taught as if they are an arcane secret language. The thing to remember is we spot these easily without needing to know the literary terms. We're using the literary terms now so you can begin to craft these into your stories. Remember last week's lesson from Somerset Mom's quotation, only a mediocre writer is always at his best. Our goal is to keep improving. The more we understand paradox, irony, and satire, and practice them in our own writing, the more we will overcome mediocrity. Paradox. Para for contrary to, dox for opinion. A paradox is a contradiction that also presents a truth. It carries the meaning beyond established thought. Society thinks one way. With the paradox, we open windows and doors to admit contrasting thoughts that are true. I started with the classic example, I always lie. The lie is a lie. How can a lie tell the truth yet still be a lie? It twists and turns. Even as we see the impossibility of the statement, we also see its truth, and that makes it a paradox. Sometimes the paradox will give us a chuckle, as in this quote from Oscar Wilde, I can resist anything but temptation. And George Bernard Shaw, what a pity that youth must be wasted on the young. In Holy Sonnet 10, John Donne's last proclamation is a paradox. One short sleep pass, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death, thou shalt die. Death dies when all the living had died, yet the now dead living continue on through their souls. Death has no soul and can't continue on. Napoleon Bonaparte is a hero and also a tyrannical dictator. He's a great field commander who poisoned his own men to allow his army to retreat. Opposites, where is the truth? That creates the paradox. While opposites create an either-or situation, the paradox is a both situation. Both contrasts are true. You may take the most gallant sailor, the most intrepid airman, the most audacious soldier, put them at a table together. What do you get? The sum of their fears. That's according to Winston Churchill in 1943. Churchill gives us the paradox of men leaders at war. Individually, they can be heroic when they consider the military men following the orders. When they add in the opposing military forces, these heroes become cowards afraid to make decisions. Consider this paradox in the Rig Veda, a Hindu creation hymn translated by Max Muller. Who knows from whence this great creation sprang? He from all this great creation came. There's the first paragraph. How can he come from what he created? Whether his will created or was mute, the most high seer that is the, in the highest heaven, he knows it, or perchance he knows it not. And how can a creator not know he's creating? The paradox and the oxymoron can be easily confused. Simply stated, in the oxymoron, we have words contrasting with each other. That's all. The paradox, however, will be phrases or sentences or stanzas or paragraphs 
that will contain that pesky, mysterious truth. As the Arthurian story cycle winds to its conclusion, a series of paradoxes begin to emerge in the story. Merlin, the great magician, entrapped by someone without magic of her own. Guinevere, the wife who is no wife. Lancelot, the loyal knight who steals his friend's wife. Modred, the son who is no son. And Arthur, the once and future king. Let's look at the recent pop hit Counting Stars, written by Ryan Tedder. Stars symbolically mean goals that we hope to accomplish, goals we cannot reach. To count stars is to look at the dreams we have and contrast it with the reality we face. I'll put links to the lyrics in the show notes. Head off now to reacquaint yourself with the song. Go on, I'll wait. A quick word on the music of video. While interesting, it defaults to the trot Hollywood criticism of religion. This song is not about religion, unless it is how we can become so devoted to dreams or materialism that we don't focus on reality. Never let a production team's vision to promote a musical group confuse you with the songwriter's or the poet's intention. That's the same type of problem when we confuse an actor with a part they played, or a character with the writer who created the character, such as Macbeth's nihilism with Shakespeare's personal beliefs. In Counting Stars, the young couple is just starting out. The persona is dreaming about the things that they could be, dreams that they have set are money-based, this is the reason he wants to abandon counting dollars. They need to recast their goals into something that is not dependent on money. In verse 1, the paradox begins. Dreams are like a swinging vine, one of those that we jump on to send us into the river of life. Life, not mere existence. Freedom, not slavery to the dollar. The persona wants to jump on that vine, but flashing signs are warning him to stop, reconsider, change. The biblical illusion of seek it out and ye shall find serves as a prod to pursue the dream he wants. As the verse continues, he reflects that he is old, but I'm not that old. This contrast seems impossible, yet it presents the mistakes he's made. He is experienced, old, but young in years. Life has tossed him around, yet he's still trying. Next, we have young, but I'm not that bold. His turbulent experiences that matured him at such a young age have also warned him not to continue ahead recklessly, an idea reinforced by the practical wisdom of others. I'm just doing what we're told. Should they follow that practical wisdom? Counting dollars has helped others get close to something that somewhat resembles their dreams. Should they continue, or should they count the stars and cast off the original dream? The line, I don't think the world is sold, appears to say yes to the second question. But thinking doesn't mean reality. The world is corrupted by the pursuit of the almighty dollar, which leads us to the three paradoxes that make this song so clever. I feel something so right by doing the wrong thing. I feel something so wrong by doing the right thing. Everything that kills me makes me feel alive. How can we feel such excitement when we do the wrong things while feeling wrong, saddened, depressed, caged, when we do the right things? That adrenaline rush we get when we break society's rules makes us take risks to be burned up with beauty, as Don Marquis informed us in the lesson of the moth in the last episode. We want to feel alive, so we recklessly abandon good sense to pursue that beauty. These paradoxes are his truth. He could lie to himself and to her, but he won't. By the way, did you notice that the first two paradoxes are in the form of chiasmus by reversing repeated words? Paradox is everywhere in the second verse. They help us understand that the couple must abandon counting dollars and a practical existence in order to achieve their starry goals. And they have to pursue those dream goals actively, which leads us to hope is our four-letter word. Four-letter words are curse words. To this couple, hope is a curse. If they merely hope instead of taking action, if they merely dream instead of believe, if they merely dream instead of taking action, their dreams will gradually fade in the pursuit of the dollars that they mistakenly think will lead them to their goals. And that leads us to the next new paradox. Everything that drowns me makes me want to fly. The daily pursuit of dollars drowns us, drowns our dreams, drowns our souls. The persona recognizes the crisis they are in, and he realizes he must flee from any practical goal that society approves. Counting stars twist everything on its head while it pounds the truth to us. And that's a simple key to approaching the paradox. 
what's the truth you want to tell, and twist the ideas that you're going to present. What's the reality, and then how can that be upturned and turned sideways? As many times we've mentioned, literature depends on opposition, protagonist versus the antagonist in conflict, themes of youth versus age, good versus evil, reason versus passion, light versus dark, ethics versus laws, many, many more. Yet pitting one event against another or one character against another will not have the greatest impact upon our audience. The strongest contrast is the oppositional shift within a character's mind, in an epiphany or in a comprehension of a circumstance. The veil of what we thought is removed and clarity destroys all expectations. This oppositional perspective shift is irony. In its simplest definition, irony is the difference between what is expected and what actually occurs. That's the key when you're writing. Here's the expected reality. Here's everything twisted about. It's the twist at the end of the story. The word comes from the ancient Greek word iron, which means dissembler or deceiver. In other words, someone who lies. Comedy is highly dependent upon irony when it's not based on raunchiness. James Thurber is a master of the ironic tale, and his ironic fairy tales are excellent examples. In Little Red Riding Hood, when the wolf threatens Red, she doesn't depend on the woodsman to save her. She pulls out a pistol and shoots the wolf. We expected the story to present its usual conclusion. The irony gives us a different ending. Besides comedy with its unexpected revelation, we can look for irony in the revelation of sonnets. Most sonnets will have a volta, a turning of perspective or thought, either at the couplet, which is the Shakespearean form, or between the sestet and octet, which is the Petrarchan form, as with Robert Southey's sonnet on winter in last episode. Here's Robert Frost working irony in Once by the Pacific. The shattered water made a misty din, great waves looking over others coming in and thought of doing something to the shore that water never did to land before. The clouds were low and hairy in the skies, like locks blown forward in the gleam of eyes. You could not tell, and yet it looked as if the shore was lucky in being backed by cliff, the cliff in being backed by continent. It looked as if a night of dark intent was coming, and not only a night, an age. Someone had better be prepared for rage. There would be more than ocean water broken before God's last put out the light was spoken. We often view nature as benevolent. We feel betrayed by tornadoes and hurricanes, earthquakes and landslides. Nature is not benevolent, just as God in a rage is not benevolent. After all, he destroyed mankind in a flood, all but one family that was loyal to him. The Volta at the ending couplet with God's last put out the light gives a surprising and unexpected announcement of whose rage would lead to land's destruction. Irony is often phrased as appearance versus reality. What we see and think will be is not what actually develops. We expect the ideal. Reality crashes over any hope of the ideal. In Charles Dickens's Great Expectations, the protagonist Pip thinks that his money comes from an old rich woman who wants to help him. Instead, he learns that the old woman never intended to help him, just use him. The money actually comes from a convict that Pip helped, only because he was afraid of the man. The convict thought Pip helped because he was a great-hearted boy. Yet another irony. And at the very end of the story, after all is revealed, the money that meant so much is lost, sinking to the bottom of the bay. There are multiple additional ironies in the story. I won't go into them all. Irony comes in three forms, plus one more. Situational irony is basic irony, the difference between what is expected and what actually occurs. Verbal irony is the use of a word in opposition to its normal meaning, telling someone who you actually hate that you are best friends, or saying, great day, when it's cold and rainy and the boss just yelled during the weekly meeting. Sarcasm is a type of verbal irony, only it is harsh and cutting, Meant to hurt. A sarcastic remark may sound like praise, but tone and inflection will remove the compliment. I thought you played the piano as well as only you could. 
Dramatic irony occurs in plays. The audience knows what the characters on stage do not. For example, after Romeo and Juliet have spent their wedding night together, we, the audience, see her mother approaching while Romeo and Juliet share a few last kisses before he has to enter exile. The closer that Lady Capulet comes to Juliet's bedroom, the more tension we feel in the hopes that she will not walk in on the young couple. Suspense is the purpose of dramatic irony. Hamlet offers a couple of examples for dramatic irony when Claudius and Polonius are plotting to have Ophelia speak of love to Hamlet. He overhears and becomes wary of their scheme, explaining his irony at Ophelia that she would fall in with her father's scheme rather than remain loyal to Hamlet. Then we have Hamlet's refusal to kill Claudius while he prays because he doesn't want to send him directly to heaven while Hamlet's father suffers in purgatory. We discover, as Hamlet does not, that Claudius was unable to pray because he is unrepentant of the murder he committed. The special kind of irony is cosmic irony, also called irony of fate. Cosmic irony is situational irony that is the result of fate, chance, the gods, or some other superhuman force or entity. The irony occurs because the situation leaves the person on a cleft stick in a damned-if-you-do, damned-if-you-don't situation. A Burnt Ship by John Dunn presents this cosmic irony for the sailors. Here it is. Out of a fired ship, which by no way but drowning could be rescued from the flame, some men leaped forth, and ever as they came near the foe's ship, did the by their shot decay. So all were lost, which in the ship were found, they in the sea being burnt, they in the burnt ship drowned. Men could stay with the ship, but they would be burnt alive. If they jumped overboard to avoid burning alive, then the enemy's ship would shoot and kill them. Or they could die by actual fire, or being fired upon. And even if they escaped the bullets or the flames, they would not escape drowning. No way to survive, so all were lost. A special division of irony, satire, uses ridicule and mockery to expose human foibles and sins, foolishness and vices. Satire has special versions, the lampoon and the farce. The Latin word comes from satura for a full dish, for a satirical text serves up many options to prove the foibles and sins which need to be ridiculed. The lampoon should be focused on a particular person. A farce is a comic play of improbabilities presented merely for humorous effect. It uses exaggeration to present the follies and sins that will be ridiculed. To spot the satire, we have to spot the folly or vice being ridiculed. The purpose of satire, yes, it has a purpose, is to point out flaws and errors by society in order to bring about social change. We make fun of something in order to improve it. The ancient Latins Horace and Juvenal had two opposing views of satire. Horace considered that satire should move people to gentle laughter since foolishness and sins are everywhere and everyone is guilty of them. Juvenal's harsh satire is appalled by foolish and sinful corruption. It wishes to eradicate that corruption through angry mockery. Juvenalian satire is not humorous. It is painful. One of the most famous examples of satire is Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal. Appalled by Parliament, allowing the Irish to starve, his then-anonymous essay proposes that the starvation problem be fixed by the application of a population reduction solution. I'll leave it to you to figure out how Swift suggests Parliament fixes his problems. When filled with clear-cut examples and non-obvious humor, satire can be easily confused with honest opinion, as happened when people viewed the Colbert Report or they read The Onion or The Babylon Bee, as if these are actual news reports. Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales presents us with both types of satire, as well as the difficulty in seeing satire. In Canterbury Tales, if we don't bring our experiences to the text, we don't know when Chaucer is being satirical. For example, the cook is satirized. He scratches the running sore on his leg, then he immediately dips his hand in to prepare a meal without washing first. Here's another. The clerk for the lawyers is uneducated, but he's making tons of money off these educated men doing work that they could easily do for themselves. The wife of Bath, who is ugly, has had multiple husbands and is on the lookout for the next one and will probably catch him. 
The perfect example is the nun, the prioress. Remember that satire is a division of irony which is based on expectation in conflict with reality. The prioress, as one of the leaders of a holy order, is supposed to care for less fortunate people. While animals do deserve our compassion and help, people should receive help first. Instead, the prioress focuses only on her little dog. She pampers and indulges the dog, rather than considering how to help people. The knight's son, the squire, should be focused on learning his trade, practicing swordcraft, how to shoot a bow and arrow. Instead, he wants to impress the girls with his appearance and clothing, and he practices singing, not swordcraft. The prioress and the squire are examples of Horatian satire. The poet saves his harsher criticism for the monk and the pardoner, both who are getting rich in their employ for the church, while they take advantage of the poor and helpless and leave a hedonistic life, even though they have sworn chastity. The only characters who escape any mockery by Chaucer are the parson and his brother the plowman. Jane Austen mastered Horatian satire. By the time she penned Pride and Prejudice, she had it down pat. Reverend Collins receives a large share of her gentle mockery. Lady Catherine de Bourgh receives several harsh touches evidenced in her concern for the cost of glass. The harsher mockery in Persuasion focuses on Sir Walter Elliot and the sisters Elizabeth and Mary with their upper-class snobbery, while the Musgroves receive gentle mockery, especially Charles, since he is contrasted with the worthy Frederick Wentworth. Mark Twain is the American master of satire. The adventures of Huckleberry Finn crosses several characters deserving of his mocking pen. His best satirical work, however, is the private history of a campaign that failed, about several young men who think that the American Civil War would be grand and glorious, full of deeds enacted by worthy heroes. To present his satire, Twain uses tropes of medieval knights on quest to rescue damsels in distress. The noble hero, his supportive squire, an aged king who needs support, a mysterious riddle, fair maidens who admire heroic knights, a trusted mentor, heroic deeds, a worthy cause, a fierce dragon, and treasure that makes the quest worthwhile. The noble hero and his squire, in Twain's private history, fight over who will carry the rusty cavalry sword. The aged king is an old soldier who wants to relive his heroics through the years. The aged king offers them a map that they can barely read because they don't know the landmarks. When the fair maidens are awakened one night, we see their curling locks are caused by tearing their hair and twist while they sleep so they have rags all over their head. The trusted mentor is a scared old man who points the way in the dark only for the youth to fall into the creek that he forgot to mention. Heroic deeds are learning to march, and most of the young men can't keep in step. When they try to ride the horses, most don't know how to saddle a horse, let alone how to ride it. They were city boys. The worthy calls, the fierce dragon, and the treasure are all tied to the Union soldiers who are riding through the county. And when the young men decide to attack, they quickly discover the cost of war is fear, pain, and death, none of which they expected. For an example by Twain of Juvenalian harsh satire, you need look no further than his war prayer, an extremely short story that derides people who pray so that their side will win when the prayer should be how to bring about the end of the war. Twain clearly presents that both sides think that they are in the right and refuse to admit that they could be wrong. They pray for the other side's defeat without considering the hardships and diseases and deaths that will result from defeat. They pray for victory rather than a compromise that will end the war. Modern examples of satire include The Simpsons, animated so that people would be more willing to accept the criticisms of middle-class life. Saturday Night Live, as originally conceived, is more farce than satire, as is Monty Python's iterations. The first season of The Office offered cringeworthy satire of the business world. Satire requires a skilled hand, not a heavy one. Heavy-handed ridicule turns into farce or lampoonery or leans even farther away into agitprop literature. Study Jane Austen as an excellent guide for Horatian satire. Joseph Heller's Catch-22 and Anthony Burgess's A Clockwork Orange 
are painful examples of excellent Juvenalian satire. Next week, we finish our enhancement series with sequentials, ordering details to achieve a climactic point and working ideas into parallel structures to mirror them and allow comparison and contrast. Oh, there is contrast again. Inspiration comes from Roy Blunt. An author is a person who can never take innocent pleasure in visiting a bookstore again. Say you go in and discover there are no copies of your book on the shelves. You resent all the other books. I don't care if they are Great Expectations, Life on the Mississippi, and the King James Bible. All the other books that are on the shelves you resent. This is so ironic because we start writing because we love to read and we have stories that we want to tell. And then to go in and other great books, great literature books, we resent because they're not ours, but they have a place available for the public. Thank God for indie publishing. Thanks for listening to The Right Focus, a podcast for writers at all levels, hosted by Emma Lee from Writers Inc. Books, assisted by Remy Black and Edie Runes. Our focus is productivity, process, craft, and tools. Music is licensed through Audio Jungle called Background Music Loop. Its creator is Alexander Polishchuk, known on Audio Jungle as Plastic 3. The music comes in different iterations. Show notes and resource links for this and other episodes can be found at therightfocus.blogspot.com. Write to us at linkbooks at aol.com when you have questions, comments, and speculations. We will try to answer you as quickly as possible. By the way, we will not mind your email address. That's rude. If you find value in our content, share with your writing friends or write a review. We're small beans here without the advertising budget of the big peeps. And you can make a difference. And whatever occurs, right on.